I'm Sarah Sherman Stokes. I'm the Associate Director of the Immigrants' Rights and Human Trafficking Program here at Boston University School of Law. And um, I also teach immigration law. Um, and in my work in the clinic, um, uh, what that means is that I actually represent, um, you know, folks that are facing deportation. Uh, some of them are detained, some of them are not, uh, but all of them are at risk of being deported from the United States and separated from their families and their communities. Um, so we sort of, you know, teach law students how to become lawyers by being real lawyers in immigration court um, and defending, you know, our neighbors and community members um, from deportation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, just so I can share my slides with you all. And uh, as Rick said, feel free to ask questions. Um, you know, I um, this would be tiresome if it was a one-way conversation. So um, hopefully, you know, I'd love to hear uh, y'all's thoughts and, and engagement on any of the issues that I'm going to cover today. Um, and so before we get going, um, I just will share with you an agenda. Um, you know, in my teaching, I always like to let you know sort of where I'm headed. Um, it's a pretty simple one today, some brief introductions. Um, I'm going to talk about the reverse freedom rides. I'm going to talk about the Martha's, migrant, uh, Martha's Vineyard migrants. Um, and then we're going to talk about sort of some lessons learned or, you know, what resistance might look like and, and think about, you know, sort of Massachusetts as a case study and, and what we might be able to do here locally um, to advocate for our um, immigrant neighbors and friends and family members. Um, before I start, though, um, I would I would love to just get a show of hands of um, who among uh, uh, y'all are retired history teachers? Um, I'm just trying to figure out what I'm up against um, <laughs> in terms of, so, uh, you know, I am a law professor. I'm, I'm not a history teacher, um, but um, I, you know, I've, um, hopefully um, we'll do, um, we'll do an adequate job covering, you know, about 1954 to 1963, which is sort of the primary period we're looking at. Um, but I hope the, the history teachers among you uh, will, will I, I welcome your friendly amendments if you think there's something I should be including. Um, all right, so um, I just, you know, Rick gave a, such a generous and, and kind introduction, um, but I want to just show for a minute rather than tell, just to give you a sense of course, sort of how I come to this work um, mm -hmm. and how I come to this um, sort of my perspective. Um, you know, I'll be very transparent. You know, I, I um, obviously I disagree with, um, you know, I disagree with what happened in the 60s. I disagree with what's happening today with the migrants. Um, and it's because I've been um, out and about in the community locally and nationally working with migrants, as I mentioned, defending migrants who are facing deportation. Um, but these are just a couple other photos of work that we've done. So on the left, um, or my left, um, you'll see myself uh, with a group of students um, in front of uh, an army base uh, where migrants were being held in shelter just a couple months ago. Um, and we were there to spend all day uh, helping process work permits for families that had recently fled violence, political instability, and poverty, primarily in Venezuela and Haiti. Um, and uh, the other photograph shows uh, me down at the U.S.-Mexico border, actually in Tijuana on the Mexico side of the border, uh, working with families who were about to cross and helping prepare them for the journey that, that lay ahead. Um, this was during the Trump administration, during family separation, um, where we were helping advise families about how to frankly, keep their families together and how to go about seeking asylum lawfully in the United States. Um, so, you know, I, I, I come to this work with a, a really particular perspective um, that I like to think is informed by a lot of sort of on the ground um, experience and um, hearing directly from immigrant communities about what is and is not working for them, um, as well as what their needs and hopes are. Um, and I try to let those needs and hopes inform uh, my work as a lawyer, as a law professor, and as, you know, as an educator. Um, so uh, with that all as background, I'm, I'm happy, as I said, to take questions as I go. Um, if you need uh, any kind of clarification on what I'm talking about, um, and also at the end, well, there'll be plenty of time for questions, both about the content um, of this presentation, but if you have additional questions about my work more generally, uh, or sort of the conversation, uh, the, really the national conversation or the local conversation about immigration, um, I'd be delighted to field those questions as well. So um, I'm going to start just by taking a step back um, to talk about 
how the reverse freedom rides started. And for some of you, maybe you've heard this term, maybe not. But following the ground support decision in the early 1950s, um, many white folks in the Deep South uh, were quite angry, right? And um, they channeled a lot of that ire into a new movement called Citizens Councils. Um, organizations of white segregationists and white supremacists who opposed integration and vehemently opposed the Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board. In fact, the first Citizens Council meeting was convened just two months after the Brown v. Board of Education decision, and it was convened in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. Um, the council uh, the councils viewed themselves as a sort of more sophisticated, um, more palatable version of, of the KKK and other what they considered to be more violent extreme groups or extreme groups. Um, so, you know, it really, the councils over the next couple of years, um, and especially in, in 1956, the councils, and here's a picture of, of one um, uh, later on in the, in the 60s, um, but they picked up momentum and legitimacy in the mid to late 1950s when the Mississippi legislature formed the State Sovereignty Commission. And, and the Sovereignty Commission contributed funds to the citizens councils and formed a covert network that tracked uh, both black and white people, um, blacks that were in favor of uh, integration and white folks that were acting as their allies. Um, and they uh, tracked these individuals in their communities um, and when they saw Black voters trying to register or get jobs, um, they would threaten uh, those jobs or even threaten their lives. Um, white businessmen faced boycotts and politicians, uh, white politicians lost votes if they were believed to be sympathetic to uh, African-American efforts at integration. So these citizens councils uh, became um, quite a force uh, in the late 1950s and, and early 1960s, they they claimed that they didn't sanction violence, um, but the venom spouted at their meetings and and from their leaders, particularly Mississippi's segregationist senator um, and sort of notorious plantation over owner James O. Eastland, um, really fostered a a violent and and pretty reactionary climate um, where punishment against Black community members was sanctioned and, and endorsed. The council's grip on Mississippi in particular was really powerful and really effective. Um, in fact, by 1956, uh, the, council, the Citizens Council in Mississippi claimed a membership of 80,000 people. Um, at the time, schools remained uh, overwhelmingly segregated and Black voter registration drives were thwarted uh, a couple years later, in 1959, the councils played a, a crucial role in electing a staunch segregationist, Ross Bar uh, Barnett, to the, governor, the governor's office. Um, it became a really powerful political force, these citizens' councils. Um, and at their height, um, they were the most powerful political force in support of segregation um, nationwide, but particularly in the American South. Had it, they had at least 300,000 members uh, by many counts. Um, and in regional and local chapters, these councils again positioned themselves as this sort of more palatable um, and more um, tolerable uh, nonviolent arm of what was really, you know, this sort of George Wallace rally rallying cry of segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. Um, but rather than sort of the overtly violent tactics employed by the KKK, um, they uh, were more likely to um, uh, take political action in terms of boycotts um, and and uh, and voting and legislative advocacy. Um, today, um, it should be noted that while the Citizens Councils of America no longer exists, there is something called the Council of Conservative Citizens, which in many ways is an outgrowth of the, the citizens councils. Um, their banner is to quote, promote the interests of European Americans. Um, it, and it's a profoundly anti-civil rights and anti-immigrant group. Um, and, and they maintain chapters throughout the South. So while the name has changed, uh, many of the ideas um, and advocacy 
uh, agenda of the Citizens Council um, remains active. Um, so I want to sort of shift to, um, you know, we started in Mississippi. Um, I want to shift to Louisiana. Um, and I want to shift to um, the sort of brainchild of this gentleman, George Singleman. Um, the reverse freedom rides are really the brainchild of, of George Singleman, of the Greater New Orleans Citizens Council. And um, he they, they were conceived um, you know, by, by the White Citizens Councils as, as a means to embarrass Northern liberal critics. Um, they were, you know, this sort of additional weapon in the arsenal of, of the war over civil rights, um, humiliating and embarrassing Northern critics, um, and an effort to remove um, Black citizens from the welfare roles. Um, and those of you that are on the edge of your seats, you know, thinking, what were they? Um, we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, but, uh, you know, they were conceived as sort of a, an, a response to, of course, the Freedom Rides. Right, so the, the Freedom Rides um, took black and white civil rights activists to the South to protest the continued segregation of, of interstate bus systems. Um, and as a response to that, as sort of some, you know, a, you know part political stunt, uh, part, you know, actual effort to uh, continue this project of segregation and uh, to humiliate uh, democratic northern states uh, who were pro-integration, in um, George Singleman and, and his council um, conceived of this, of this plan. So what were the reverse freedom rides? Um, they were a promise to Black families of a new life um, in uh, a new life of prosperity in northern states. Um, all it took was, you know, they were given a, a free one-way trip to the North. Um, and uh, it was sort of advertised as an escape from the discrimination and poverty of Jim Crow and a chance at pros prosperity um, in the North. Um, again, that's how it was advertised. Um, but of course, it was very far from that. Um, this is a, a little news item. I dug up from April 24th, 1962, um, which describes it as a, these reverse freedom rides as a cynical stunt. Um, and uh, says, you know, the New York Times opines, this was a cheap trafficking in human misery on the part of Southern racists, not something that anyone in the South can be proud of. So a bit of perspective, even as far back as, as 1962. Um, so, these uh, reverse freedom rides uh, took about, um, a, you know, just a couple hundred uh, black families um, from the South and sent them, you know, probably about 200 to 300 um, individuals and families from the South to the North, including uh, to Hyannis, um, with the promise that they'd be, you know, dropped on uh, the Kennedy's doorstep, um, which may sound familiar um, about, you know, dropping migrants on uh, the doorstep of the vice president's house. Um, and they were largely privately funded endeavors. And, um, and, and as I'll talk about in a few minutes, they, they didn't last for very long. They sort of lost steam, um, as they were increasingly exposed for what they were, which were crass political stunts, um, that didn't have a lot of staying power. Um, with that in mind, I want to fast forward us, uh, several decades, um, to the spring and summer of 2022 um, and talk about sort of what we've been seeing over the last year and a half. Um, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about sort of um, what, uh, you know, comp what comparisons we can draw between these two, uh, these two political stunts and what lessons we might take away uh, for our own advocacy today. So, um, in the spring and summer of 2022, we saw the governors of Arizona and Texas um, in particular, but also Florida, um, vowing to, quote, bring the border to northern blue states, right? Us 
unknowing liberals here in Massachusetts uh, that didn't know what it was like to live in a border state, uh, couldn't possibly imagine the strain or uh, fear or terror that border states were experiencing. Um, and governors vowed to, uh, you know, bring those issues home uh, to us in Massachusetts and, and other northern states um, by sending by bus and by plane uh, thousands of migrants uh, to Washington, New York, Massachusetts, and other northern cities. And these efforts, um, it should be noted, echoed a, a bill introduced in 2021 by Senator Ted Cruz, Republican Ted Cruz, um, to send migrants arriving in South Texas to the Northeast and to California. Um, so there was legislative effort. There was a real media narrative that was shaping up around um, what a lot of these Southern uh, GOP governors were desperate to do, um, which was to make, you know, sensibly make the Northern States feel the pain um, that these border states were experiencing um, with, with rapid, um, uh, you know, rapid growth in the arrival of migrants over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, it was interesting when I was doing, um, you know, some additional research for this presentation, um, I, I hadn't really conceived of the number the of, of migrants we were talking about that had been bussed and uh, sent by plane. Um, and I was shocked um, at the numbers that I found. Um, this sort of white supremacy by state action um, has yielded a massive movement of migrants from the South to the North. So from Texas alone, um, over 100,000 migrants uh, were sent North um, from, from Texas alone. And you can see um, where they landed. These numbers are cumulative. Um, and, and again, the state chartered buses that we're talking about here are only one of many ways that migrants uh, have been moved around the country, also by private chartered planes, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So you have, um, you know, sort of a, a post-election moment um, as we're coming toward the end of COVID. Measures on the border are changing ever so slightly um, following a Trump presidency. Um, I'm happy to talk more about those policies if they're of interest, but there were certain policies that were um, uh, that were about to expire. Uh, Title 42, primary among them, which was barring asylum at the border. And the fear among many Southern GOP governors was that this was going to be like opening, um, you know, just throwing the gates open, hundreds of thousands of migrants are coming in. And so they wanted to have a proactive, you know, response uh, to this sudden um, surge of migrants. Um, and I, I will note, you know, you, I want to be careful about the language that we use and be really intentional about the language that we use. Uh, the media so often uses terms like surge and flood and cascade, right? These are words that are usually describing a natural disaster, not, um, not the arrival of human beings and families. Um, but that's what these governors were fearing, and uh, they were vowing to to send people north rather than um, house them or care for them in their southern states. So amidst this backdrop of, of some changing federal policy, uh, because after all, immigration is federal, it's not state specific, it is, it is federal. Um, amidst this changing landscape of federal policy, um, amidst the expiration of certain um, bans at entry uh, at the southern border, um, the sort of ramping down of COVID protocols, um, and frankly, um, rising political instability in some very specific places, um, primarily Honduras, Haiti, and Venezuela. Um, this sort of conflation of factors um, was a really specific moment, I would offer, um, that sort of led to, I think, you know, what, what we've seen unfold over the last uh, 18 months, two years. So I want to bring us, I guess, then to uh, to Martha's Vineyard and to sort of the sort of case study of Martha's Vineyard. So um, sort of engage in a thought exercise here, bring us all back to um, September of 2022. Um, and so school year was just starting. And um, I remember, you know, getting um, very, uh, a very uh, sort of, anxious and um, flabbergasted phone call from a state senator um, 
around Martha's Vineyard saying, you know, do you know why all these people just landed on Martha's Vineyard? Um, and we didn't, we had no idea, right? So um, earlier that day at 8 a.m., two planes had left, um, had left San Antonio, Texas. And on those planes were 48 migrants, uh, 48 or 49. I, I, there seems to be a discrepancy in reporting, but 48 or 49 migrants, um, nearly all from Venezuela, uh, including children that had arrived by chartered planes on Wednesday afternoon to Martha's Vineyard. And of course, officials on the island were completely ambushed. They were completely surprised. They had no idea. Um, and we have to back up a little bit to figure out kind of how this happened, right? So amidst this changing federal landscape, you have, you know, governors like Ron DeSantis, um, who in June of 2022 had signed uh, a budget that set aside $12 million to create a program specifically to transport migrants out of Florida, uh, specifically to transport unauthorized migrants out of Florida. And he touted it as a highlight of the state's new spending when it came to immigration. Um, and of course, three months later in September, that money was being used far from Florida, right? That money um, was used to round up Venezuelan asylum seekers on the streets of San Antonio and ship them on a private plane to Massachusetts, on two private planes to Massachusetts. In the case of the flights to Martha's Vineyard, um, Florida state records show that an airline charter company, Vertol Systems, was paid $615,000 on September 8th and $950,000 less than two weeks later. So an extraordinary amount of money. Um, and I'll just take a, a moment sort of as a sidetrack. Um, I always tell my students when we're talking about immigration detention uh, to, to follow the money. And I think the same is true here. I think it's worth noting that Vertol Systems was founded in the 90s and, and offers um, sort of immigration, uh, excuse me, aviation maintenance and training services and, and um, consistently has done work for the US government since its founding. But increasingly over the last few years, it has networked with, um, I guess what I would call Republican power brokers in Florida. And um, in litigation, court records show that Vertol was once represented by Matt Gates, uh, who's now a Republican member of Congress and a close ally, of course, of, of Ron DeSantis. Um, and, um, and another lawyer uh, whom the company used as their representative for a series of lawsuits uh, is a guy named Larry Keefe. Uh, Larry Keefe uh, was DeSantis's, quote, public safety czar. Um, who was responsible for leading efforts to confront immigration issues. Uh, Vertol and its CEO, James Montgomery, have also donated to a number of Republican legislators, including Gates, uh, Representative Jay Trumbull, who led the Florida House Appropriations Committee um, and, um, and, and was leading that committee when all this money was earmarked for tr the transportation of migrants. So um, really hard, I think, to disentangle um, kind of all these pieces and, and really important to sort of name them. Um, so, but how did, you know, it, it still begs the question, how did these folks, these 49 Venezuelan migrants get on a plane in San Antonio and end up in Martha's Vineyard for this, you know, political stunt? Um, so the, these migrants were in San Antonio having just crossed the border. Um, they were approached by a woman who they knew as Perla, uh, who was later found to be a member of the U.S. Armed Forces who had recently been discharged um, and was working to recruit them and get them on the plane. She promised them that they would have um, food and lodging and um, a chance for a better life and that they would have uh, work permits waiting for them um, and that those work permits would be expedited. Um, and and the migrants said that this woman was trying to recruit people, you know, up until just hours before the flight took off. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, a spokesman for Greg, Greg Abbott at the time, right, because, of course, this was a um, concerted effort between both uh, Governor DeSantis and, and Governor um, uh, Greg Abbott said, you know, our office has had conversations with Governor DeSantis and his team about supporting our busing strategy to provide, quote, much needed relief to our overwhelmed and overrun border communities. Um, and they said, you know, uh, Abbott said, we appreciate this support in responding to the national crisis and helping Texans. 
um, and that Governor Abbott encourages and welcomes all of his fellow governors to engage in this effort to secure the border and, border and focus on the failing and illegal efforts of the Biden-Harris administration to continue these reckless open border policies. Um, happy to talk about the accuracy of those statements at the end if folks have questions. Um, but nevertheless, that um, that was the message that was being sent. Um, Clearly, there was coordination between the governors of these two southern states in an effort to move as many migrants north as possible. Um, again, they were promised cash assistance, um, actually eight months of cash assistance, um, job offers, and expedited work permits, as well as shelter. Um, so what happened? Um, I think, you know, a, a number of things. Um, I'll start with some of the positives here. Um, Massachusetts residents, faith communities, and lawyers swept in to help, um, right? We saw this beautiful, beautiful showing of um, a community that gathered to support these 49 migrants um, in really meaningful ways, preparing food, providing shelter. Um, I think one of my favorite photos was the AP Spanish class that was um, basically released to go provide interpretation services, um, you know, to these 49 migrants. Um, you know, the power of these these high school students in AP Spanish to, to be able to serve as interpreters, I thought was a really, really beautiful moment. Um, migrants were connected with shelter, education, and legal assistance. Um, ironically, um, the migrants that were bused to Martha or flown to Martha's Vineyard may be more likely to receive immigration status uh, due to two things. Um, one is the availability of a U visa. So uh, without getting too much in the weeds, but, but happy to get more into it in the Q&A if folks have questions. Um, these, uh, there is a criminal investigation into what happened with this, these two chartered flights and, uh, U visas are special visas that are available to migrants who assist in the investigation or prosecution of a crime. Um, and that could be everything from just speaking to a police officer or a detective to testifying at a grand jury, um, or anything in between. Um, and so uh, many of these migrants uh, are now pursuing U visas, which are a pathway to a green card and to citizenship. Um, and they're doing so because they were duped and tricked uh, as part of uh, this political stunt. Um, and they have since participated in the investigation of that crime. And the second thing is that immigration is federal, but immigration courts are local. Um, and what I mean by that is while immigration law is governed by the federal government um, and written by Congress, uh, different jurisdictions have different different reputations in terms of their immigration courts. So here in Massachusetts, we have the Boston Immigration Court, and you can look online and see what the likelihood is of being granted asylum or other forms of relief from deportation. Um, and in general, it is higher than many of the courts in Texas or Florida. So simply by being present and in deportation proceedings in the state of Massachusetts, um, folks are more likely to be able to stay in the United States with authorization uh, and pursue you know, lawful immigration status. Um, I'm sure that was not the intended outcome of DeSantis and Abbott, but it, it is, I think, one of the benefits that's worth noting. Um, but of course, the the takeaways of the Martha's Vineyard migrants and sort of the larger scale moving of migrants to northern cities is also more nuanced and more complex. Um, yes, it's these pro, you know, beautiful, profound humanitarian and people to people aid and assistance, um, but it's also struggle, right? And so what we're increasingly seeing and what we're uh, seeing here locally in Massachusetts um, with our, with Governor Healy and with Mayor Wu in Boston and elsewhere um, is cities and states that are saying, hey, we're struggling. Um, and they are asking the feds to step in with resources um, to support cities that feel like they are overwhelmed and underfunded and unable to uh, provide the support that is needed for these growing communities of migrants. Um, and of course, what I what I think is is uh, profoundly dangerous is a growing fear-based narrative around governments take uh, sorry around immigrants taking limited resources, um, and I think that's the narrative that I feel uh, 
um, you know, it's it's not new, but I think it's certainly more pronounced um, in recent weeks and months, um, and I think is is already becoming uh, a really powerful narrative in this national election cycle. Um, on a local level, um, you know, a vote is happening today as we speak on a supplemental budget that would steer another $245 million to the state's shelter system, uh, but would also cap the maximum length of stay at nine months. Um, and that is would be a new cap, uh, which, which many of us, myself included, are opposed to. Um, the bill would also require Governor Healy to, to seek out uh, federal waivers for expedited temporary and permanent work authorization. Um, to help more migrants exit the shelter system and, and get them to work. I can tell you from volunteering uh, in some of these shelters um, with, with migrant families, they want to work and they have you know any number of skills that I think would be really valuable to our communities and our economy. Um, we have a nursing uh, shortage in Massachusetts among other industries. Um, and there are many migrants who are ready and eager to fill those roles. Um, but, uh, you know, there is, um, we have a state government here in Massachusetts saying that they are stretched to the limit, that they cannot provide shelter, that they cannot provide funding and resources uh, for these growing migrant communities. Um, and increasingly people saying, you know, we don't have, we don't have the budget, right? Um, we have other needs of, you know, folks that have been here before these migrants arrived. Um, that say, you know, we don't have the resources. Uh, there isn't enough money to go around. I'm happy to talk more about sort of how I might respond to that. Um, but but what I would offer, of course, is, you know, what I think all of us know is that, you know, budgets are about choices. Um, and here in the state of Massachusetts, we've made some pretty deliberate choices about how we want to spend our budget. Um, and, you know, I think um, there has to be a reckoning about whether or how to reallocate uh, those funds uh, to to our immigrant neighbors and communities, just you know, sort of as a snapshot or to give you a sense, um, this is the Massachusetts state budget for for public safety in 2024. And public safety covers, you know, everything from um, you know, including or the state police, um, fire, FEMA, uh, Department of Corrections, and the parole board. Um, and you can see, I mean, these are numbers that I don't, you know, I barely know how to say out loud. They're so large, um, right? This is an enormous amount of money uh, going toward policing um, and uh, prisons in our state, uh, money which, you know, presumably could be potentially reallocated. But of course, you know, budgets are about choices and, and how we choose to spend that money. Uh, but I think that's one of the, unfortunately, one of the narratives that's emerged from um, folks being sent north um, is that Democrats, you know, what, what you'll hear the media say is Democrats are starting to talk like Republicans, right? Which is, of course, exactly the intended impact uh, and the, the, the desire of Republican governors like DeSantis and Abbott and others um, is that, you know, these northern blue states would, quote, feel the pain um, and be tougher on immigration, be more likely or, or sort of be, be less likely to support um migration and be more likely to support uh, increased enforcement on the border and elsewhere. So with all this in mind, um, I want to take a couple minutes to just kind of take stock of, of some of the comparisons between what we saw in the, the 1960s and, and what we're seeing today. Um, you know, as you can see, there's a lot of points of, of similarity and overlap, right? Um, this is this, the busing of migrants north is like a, feels like a redux um, or maybe a remix of, of the reverse freedom rise of the early 1960s, right? So we see in both cases that deceit is used to move people of color to the north, uh, that people of color are used as political pawns to embarrass white liberals and test their commitment to either racial equity or immigrants' rights, and that these actions are deeply racist and dehumanizing, right? We are moving people like cattle, um, you know, putting them on planes as if they were less than human, um, taking away their agency and decision making, and sending them wherever we wish. Um, it's also worth noting that the migrants that are sent north are predominantly migrants of color, 
those are not the only migrants that are crossing the southern border, right? There have been plenty of, for example, white Ukrainian migrants and asylum seekers that have crossed given the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, those are not the migrants that are being bused um, to northern cities. There are some profound differences, of course, uh, between what happened in the early 1960s and today. And the, the, two, um, the two sort of most pronounced differences, I think, are, are one, the numbers. Um, so between 200 and 300 were sent north in the early 1960s. Um, well over 100,000 have been sent north in the last two years. Um, obviously, you know, that is a number that we're going to feel um, significantly more than the two to 300 uh, in the early 1960s. Um, the 1960s uh, political stunts were privately funded, whereas in these cases, we're seeing the use of public dollars, right? Legislatures that are appropriating funds specifically uh, for the transportation of migrants out of their state um, and, and north. Um, I should note the Citizens Council in Louisiana tried to, to get public funds um, for the reverse freedom rides, but they were unsuccessful. Um, and just a little comparison here. Um, so black families arriving in Cape Cod uh, during the reverse freedom rides of the early 1960s, and then uh, on, uh, next to it, uh, immigrants arriving to Martha's Vineyard in September of 2022. Right. And, and now we get to the part where, you know, I have some thoughts, but I'd also really welcome um, your thoughts and questions and engagement here. Um, and we're going to get to um, the part where I really open it up for, for your questions um, for the last 30 minutes or so. And that is sort of what lessons can we learn? So as I alluded to earlier, um, the reverse freedom rides um, really failed to sustain the pro-segregationist resistance. Um, I think there are, you know, conceivably several reasons for that. Um, one of them was certainly that quote unquote moderate segregationists, honestly, that, that sounds like an oxymoron to me, but, um, for lack of a better uh, description, moderate segregationists were embarrassed, uh, by the political hijink hijinks of the citizens councils and the really cruel and virulent racism that it exposed. Um, and they wanted to distance themselves, um, from that cruel racism. Now, it wasn't that they weren't racist or didn't believe in segregation. Uh, they just uh, sort of clothed it differently. Um, it was less violent, it was less bombastic, and it was less public. Um, and I think the question that I have, um, and I don't, um, I think I've, I've struggled with, with what the answer might be here. Um, I will opine a little bit, but then, as I said, I'd, I'd love your, your thoughts and questions. Um, is will the same thing be true for migrants? Um, you know, reverse freedom rides uh, for many of us is not something we learned about in school. We learned about freedom rides, uh, but we didn't learn about the backlash. Um, and partly I think that's because um, the numbers were so much smaller than what we're seeing today, right? 200 to 300 individuals. Um, and so the reverse freedom rides sort of have taken up a footnote in American history. Um, and I think the jury is a bit out on whether um, these, you know, more than 100,000 migrants that have been transported in the reverse freedom rides of 2022 and 2023 will um, will be embarrassing uh, for the right, um, you know, or I think, you know, at, at the risk of <laughs> at the risk of ending on a cynical note, um, and I, I will end on a hopeful note, um, but before there, I'll before we get there, I'll share some cynicism, um, which is uh, that things have moved, uh, sort of the the dial has moved so far, the pendulum has swung so far uh, to the right when it comes to conversations around migrants and migration. Um, and there are a lot of what I would suggest are uh, sort of factually false narratives being peddled about migration and migrants um, that there isn't the level of embarrassment or shame um, or the you know racism that's been exposed that is going to deter people from continuing this, or you know incentivizing people, politicians, and voters to distance themselves from these political hijinks. Um, in fact, it it seems to me that it has um, it has you know been accepted as sort of part of the political 
um, bargain uh, that that we're all kind of part of. Um, you know, so where I am, you know, perhaps cynical or, or skeptical that um, that rev that the reverse freedom rides of today will peter out in the way that they did uh, in the 60s. Um, I am hopeful. <laughs> um, I am hopeful that those of us that um, care for immigrant communities will continue to stand up for immigrant communities and let folks in power know and remind folks of, in power that um, immigrants are not expendable. Um, and that this fear-based narrative around migration is unacceptable, um, that we'll vote with our feet, um, you know, that we will um, locally and at a state and national level elect people who are pro-immigrant um, and who are going to allocate resources and budgets in ways that support uh, our growing immigrant community and, and recognize the value that immigrants provide to our communities, our schools, our economies, our places of work and worship. Um, and, and I'm happy to talk more about sort of resources for doing that or strategies around doing that. Um, 